Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Star Scholars Leadership Series. I am your host, Dr. Mary M.J. McConnor, and I am here with Dr. Gorjuan Wade from Texas Lutheran University, and he is the Vice President of Student Affairs. Welcome. Thank you, Doc. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Looking forward to our conversation. I um, definitely appreciate the opportunity to have the chat, to have the engagement. So I'm um, a fan of yours and all the work that you're doing. So I appreciate that. And looking forward to our talk today. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. And I'm definitely excited because, as you know, I come from the student affairs sector, and you're the first guest that we've had so far who's from student affairs. Yes. So you're right. Yeah, most of our guests have uh, come from the academic affairs realm. And so that's why I felt like it was really important to hear your journey and hear more about the work you do um, as a student affairs practitioner. So I'm wondering if you could just start by telling us a little bit about uh, what your journey has been like and how you got into student affairs. Yeah, so I appreciate that question. It, it it's, I feel like I'm telling like it started long ago. Um, so I was in my undergrad years, I was a student at Grand Lake State University in the Piney Hills of North Louisiana um, from Monroe, Louisiana, and was just happenstance in college, didn't really know I was going to be a college student, but I just knew I wanted to get out from where I was. So landed at Grambling. And um, by my sophomore year, I started doing my work study in student activities. Um, and they were like, ah, well, you know, we got a lot of stuff going on and I like to try to go home to help and work and do stuff there. So they said, well, maybe you should try another office on campus. So I ended up in the president's office. Um, and that only lasted for maybe like a couple of days. And they were like, you know, we you got to look a certain part here. You got to dress a certain part. I didn't have those type of clothes. I didn't have ties and, and shirts they expected students to wear in that space. So they mm -hmm. said, you know, maybe try student affairs. So I ended up working in the vice president of student affairs office for my work study. And that's how my story began in student affairs, because I got the opportunity to work hands on with some really good people doing really good work. Um, poured into me, nurtured me, and guided me to say, you know, this might be a career path for you. You know, I would stay there late with them because they were always there after I was the VP and her assistant. And just watching them move and do the work of supporting students in that space, I said, well, maybe this is something I would want to do. So um, the rest is kind of history. So I, I have not looked back since then, you know, from Rez Live to working with student housing, both on and off campus and coming back to campus and saying, I, I wanna to try to be in a more traditional setting. So that's how my trajectory began. And that's that's where I'm at now is, you know, being immersed in the world of student affairs, trying to find a way to continue to pour into students from this perch as those did before me when I was a student. So I'm um, looking forward to continue to do the work of student affairs. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, you touched on something that I, I hear quite often for, from people who work in this space. Like, because for me, when I was at Grand Valley State University, that's where I did my undergrad. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I got introduced to student affairs. I didn't even know. I was like, oh, this looks like so much fun. I did an right, internship right. <laughs> my senior year and I was going to be a psychologist. That was my goal. I, I was a psychology major. Right. It was exposure through that internship where I decided I was like, oh, uh, I might stay in higher education. This is this seems like a great career to be in. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious. You talked about the mentorship piece a little bit, too. Um, you know, what role has that played in, in your career, even at this point, it's in terms yeah. of uh, I think it's essential, you know, and I think there's layers to mentorship. You know, it, it's definitely important at the undergrad level for our students, making sure that they can see themselves and us and what their trajectory should be. But I think that doesn't stop at the professional level, right? I still have folk who I call or I text and say, am I crazy? Uh, you know, did I make the right decision on this? Or what would you do? You know, and I think it's important for us to have a what I like to call a hedge of protection of, of good, well-credentialed, passionate, honest people who will continue to, to support you throughout your journey in this work. So, you know, I think mentorship, it doesn't get enough, it doesn't get enough support when it comes down to how it impacts us, I think professionally and especially on the undergrad level and even at the grad school level. But I wouldn't be where I am right now without, you know, good mentors, you know, who gave me what I needed to try to find my journey, find my path um, for success. So it, it's, it's extremely important. I think we really need to continue at the institutional level and as professionals try to pour back into other folks, you know, continue to support colleagues 
um, by holding that ladder, right? So making sure we continue to have people who we can have that lean on each other. So I think mentorship is it's, it's critical, very critical. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And so I guess I'm curious, you, um, so a part of the reason you got into the field was because of some of the mentors you had in your experience during your undergrad at Grambling State University. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else that prepared you for the student affairs field? So like certain professional development opportunities or like degree programs, what, what else prepared you to become a student affairs practitioner? Yeah, yeah. So um, my undergrad was public administration, political science. I was going to be the governor of Louisiana, and I felt like I needed to have a college degree to do that. So that was going to be my, that was that was me. And I realized, <laughs> well, maybe that was going to take a little bit more than I thought. So, you know, the student affairs thing came to fruition. Um, and I was very determined not to go back to school. Like, I was like, I'm good with my undergrad. I don't want to, I don't want a master's. Doctorate was never in the cards. Never, ever, ever, ever. But I was at an institution and I had a supervisor who was the dean of students and just, you know, was not the best as far as, you know, cultivating, you know, leadership and talent in our team. And I said, if this is what it takes to, to be in that role, then I know I can do this better. So maybe I do need to go ahead and go back to school and get my master's. So that's when I returned to get my master's in higher ed leadership and administration um, at Walden University. So, you know, I was a working professional. I was a dad. I was a husband. I needed something that was flexible for me. So online was the route to go. Um, so got my master's. And then I realized, well, maybe this doctorate thing is going to have to come about because, again, I wanted to be able to inflict, you know, consequential change. And I know that in our world of higher ed, sometimes credentials matter. So I needed to continue to go on and, and do that. So, I got involved with NASPA. Um, I went to my NASPA, my first NASPA regional conference I went to right after I finished my master's program. I tried to start networking, meeting people, learning folks, and you know, hearing their stories. And it was, it was a resounding um, conversation that you're going to have to go get that doctorate if you want to continue to progress in our craft. So back to school, got my education uh, doctorate degree in higher ed leadership, want to continue that, that track. Um, but Having the credentials that spoke to what my passions were, so staying in the higher ed realm for my master's and my doctorate, um, being engaged with organizations like NASPA and ACPA, I want to get a little bit more involved with as well. I'm um, mean, looking for those professional connections and those opportunities to grow me, right? You know, just like a, a musician continues to practice their craft, I think that professional development opportunities and additional educational attainment helps us to be better at our craft. So um, still trying to learn, still trying to meet colleagues such as yourself who I can continue to to cipher this synergy from to continue to be better for my students. So I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because, um, you, and, you know, you see a different pathways to where mm -hmm. you are now, VP of Student Affairs. And so that kind of seg segues into my next question, because some people start like maybe in residence life, like you mentioned, or they'll yeah. start, um, you know, in some other area like student activities. And so can you talk a little bit about the different areas you oversee? Because we do have a lot of uh, international faculty and scholars who uh, are watching this from all different parts of the world. And so awesome. their institutions are structured a little differently. And yeah. so can you talk about some of the departments you oversee and like what those departments do for people who yeah. may not fully really understand what student affairs is like in the U.S. education system. Yeah, that's a great question, and shout out to my res life folk. You know, I, I, they don't get enough love and appreciation for the work that they do. Um, so, in my current role, I have two direct reports, which is um, our ABP for student affairs, and I have a dean of students. The dean of students who handles most of our student service units is what I call them, and then our ABP she handles most of our student experience units. But all of our we have eight total units within our division of student affairs, and they encompass a, a gamut of different spectrums from student health and wellness, counseling and accessibility services, um, campus activities and student engagement, which is one of my favorite spaces, campus living, which is our housing and res life operation. We also are responsible for um, advising support, so working with our faculty partners to make sure our first year students are adequately advised for their career track. Uh, we've got service learning and career development, which they have a lot of synergy together as far as making sure students are well-rounded on their career path. Um, we've also got first-year experience and student transitions, which is another one of my favorite areas, just because that's the entry point to our students that come into the institution. Um, and, make sure who have to get. and we have student success and retention, which is a very important one right now as our institution is working on a five-year plan 
to improve our student retention. So that office in particular um, is on the front lines of working with our outside partners and trying to internalize how can we be better about supporting students to graduation, getting more students across the stage with degree in hand. Um, so I work with some really good people and they have, they have welcomed me into a space. I came, my predecessor was a long time um, VP here for almost 20 years. So it's been quite a transition to come in this new guy in this new space with these folks who have been here and are used to something. Um, but I think that's the beauty of student affairs is that we have such a very unique fabric of interwoven talents and skills where it's, it's good for our students to see that. So whether it's, you know, here or abroad, you know, you've got to have the right departments, I think, aligned to, to support your students. So don't be afraid that if we've got to change or reorganize or shake this shake the table, so to speak, to do that if we're going to make sure we support the students. And that's what we did. You know, we had a, uh, we totally rearranged our division, new department titles to better align with our focus and our mission. Um, and so far, we're seeing some pretty positive results. Yeah. And you know what? That makes me happy to hear that, you know, you all saw okay, let's realign this. Let's let's shake it up a little bit yeah. um, because I'll tell you, and I've had this conversation with numerous practitioners in higher education. <laughs> and, and sometimes as a field, we are slow to evolve compared Absolutely. to other industries. Yeah. Um, especially we are stuck in our ways. We are, we are stuck in our ways. And when you look at like corporate and, and some other industries and how quick they just evolve, um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important for us to be mindful of that, that the needs of our students today are going to be a lot different than the students Absolutely. from 10 years ago. And so this, this is kind of leading into this next question. The past three to four years have been particularly hard for, I think, a lot of us uh, in every industry, right? And it, particularly student affairs folks had to bear a lot of the work, um, you know, especially with COVID and the pandemic. And so just thinking about that, like, how do you think this has affected today's students? And what are you all doing to, to kind of make sure that our students are okay, essentially? Because I know it's taking such a toll on so many people. And, and then it's, sorry, <laughs> but oh. the students, your staff too, just thinking about maybe some burnout and fatigue that happened there. So I guess I'm just curious what it, what that has been like for you. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think if you would have told me pre-COVID, we will be where we are right now, and that the ethos of higher ed, specifically with student affairs, had not changed tremendously because of that, I would have said no way. Um, but I think in this moment that COVID has given us, if it's given us anything, it has given higher ed, now specifically say student affairs, an opportunity for a hard reset, um, a true pivot to how we have operated. So when we talk about you know, some of the challenges that our students are facing now when we don't have as many students who um, are coming in with the standardized testing, what does that look like for institutional operations? We have students now who are not coming into the institution as well prepared. And there's this conversation about, you know, academic readiness. We've been talking about this in my space, um, but it's a comparison between academic readiness and academic agency. You know, have institutions looked at how they operate it, are we really providing a succinct opportunity and experience to students who are not the same students from three years ago? And I think it goes back to a point that you made that we are struggling with that as, as an industry. You know, we are, you know, we're seeing the more mental health and wellness challenges now from students who have gone through so much these past few years. But the other piece of that, as you mentioned, is what about our teams, right? We, we had these remote work options that came about right in the beginning and kind of tapered off where we continue to offer our team members here um, at least one day a week to, you know, stay remote, you know, give you an opportunity to kind of be in a, a comfortable space, but still be effective for our students. And we have not missed a beat, so to speak, in how do we engage and support our students. Um, so I think that institutions have to continue to be mindful of talent retention. You know, what can we do to make our work environment better for our folks because the market in itself, trying to lose people and then recruit and hire people, that's a struggle and that impacts student success. So if we're truly student-centered and focused on positive student outcomes, you gotta take care of your people, right? So, you know, it's just like sending a, a, a fire platoon to go and fight a fire, but they haven't slept in days. And you expect them to be effective and, and do that work? It doesn't work. So we have to be better about our people. And I think that that starts with, with leaders 
I think that it starts with a very new crop of leaders who are assuming some vice presidential roles, some AVP roles, who are looking at things not as old school as some of us were raised from some of our mentors, but how can we you know, take in mind that folks want to make a certain kind of money, but they also want flexibility in the workplace. That has to trickle down to work happiness and how we support and engage with our students. So in a, in a space now where you know multiple students we see in our offices each day and each week are struggling with some kind of mental health or mental wellness issues, or college affordability issues, or you know, the student loan conversation is hot right now. That comes back on student affairs practitioners because you know we're we're paying loans. We're also trying to counsel students on you know taking out what they need to be able to survive this college trajectory, so to speak. So there's a lot of different factors I think that's involved that student affairs folk on the front lines of, but also that our student affairs and higher ed really need to take a, a deeper dive in that. How can we pivot now? This is a very critical moment for us. What should we do different? What should we not regress back to? You know, And I think that the, the industry is struggling with that. And I don't think we've really got a grasp on how that looks moving forward. Yeah, no, yeah, and you're absolutely right. And I couldn't agree more. Um, and of course, I, you know, we we read those articles and inside yeah. and then the chronicle. And we're also seeing another thing too that I think we're going to have to figure out as an industry is the enrollment piece. Yes. And I know you don't necessarily oversee enrollment management, but that does affect uh, it does. The area it does. And so I guess I'm just curious, like, what do you, what do you think we're going to have to do as an industry to really address that matter? Because we are seeing declining enrollment uh, at a lot of institutions all across <laughs> the U S everywhere, pretty much. So. Yeah, it's, it's a thing. And uh, I don't know if, and I'll, I'll go back a little bit to my previous, you know, response to your other query. Just I don't know how willing higher ed is to change, right? So if we know, we know that we're not accepting or admitting the same types of students as we were pre-COVID, or you know, students are interested in different types of majors now than they were pre-COVID. Why are we not? adapting to that. And I think some institutions are doing that very well. I think it's harder for, for some of the public institutions to kind of make some of those pivots just because of the politics involved with some of these things. But I think the private institutions and community colleges, I think, are really on the front line of being able to change the landscape, right? Um, I always give shouts out to, to the community college teams and the folk doing that work because I think they're really really close to the ground on hearing and seeing things that we don't always see on some of these traditional four-year colleges. Um, they do really good at student support services, you know, and I think if, if private institutions, you know, you talk about how do we change, how do we be better, I think if we took more of the, the good things that are working at community colleges and replicated that for our institutions, then we'd be better at serving students across the gamut, across the board. But I, I don't know if I don't know if higher ed is ready for that. And I don't know when higher ed is gonna be ready. You know, I think we have a lot of smart colleagues, a lot of smart presidents, um, but I think some of the political dynamics of governance and boards keep some of these institutions from saying, you know what, we're not gonna require essays for admissions anymore. We're just gonna let every student that wants to come in and we're gonna give them enough funding to be able to keep them here. I think those type of progressive and aggressive changes to the, the ethos of higher ed. So I'll start with leadership. It's really gonna start with leaders coming in and saying, you know what, I'm gonna do this different. Um, mm -hmm. And until that happens across the board with enough people and enough different components of the spectrum of higher ed, then we're gonna to continue to be in the same place we are. So it really starts with leaders to, to say, we wanna admit students and we wanna grow our numbers, but we're gonna, change what that looks like you know we can continue to bake these cakes right use these recipes but the icing doesn't have to be the same all the time you know maybe we can mix it up do whip one day or try buttercream another day so i think we, we really gotta mix up how we do it um we can stay with our core but higher ed's not there yet and it, it's really going to take good leaders like you having these conversations in these type of spaces and then invigorating something in folks to say hmm, maybe i can think about it differently that's the only way it's going to change that's the only yeah. way it'll change 
Yeah, I agree with you. And thank you for that. Um, and, and one thing I love that you mentioned, thank you for this too, is you mentioned community colleges. Because I do feel like our community colleges are usually doing a lot of innovative things that they don't always get credit for. You're and right. a lot of times I notice too, structurally, I guess just because the way they're structured compared to, you know, the more traditional four-year institutions, but mm -hmm. they are able to pivot much faster. They are. They are. So uh, <laughs> there are certain things that community colleges are doing that I wish they got more recognition for. And yes, I agree. They're very nimble when it comes down to, oh, we got more students who are our parents and we need to make sure we got adequate childcare on campus for those students and they make it happen. And you know, versus in some of the more traditional, you know, four-year settings, it's like, oh, well, you know, you see the videos on social media, you know, the kid had to bring, you know, their their child, you know, to class because they don't have adequate support or child care services on those campuses or connectedness with outside groups in the city to be able to have spaces to take kids so the parents can come to class and learn and engage and provide a better space for their family. So community colleges are well, but they do that really, really good. And you know, I, I'm a fanboy when it comes down to them because, you know, I, I follow some really good people on social, as I know you do as well, and you see this work that they're doing, and it's like, why aren't other people, and I think there's a stigma, honestly, that some folk at the four years, they look at, you know, community college, it's kind of like, oh, that's just community college, they're, they're two years, but they are doing work, and I think if you had those same models that some of the community colleges have at four years, that you would see higher retention and graduation rates. You would see better persistence at those institutions, especially among first-gen students and particularly among students of color. But folks don't give community colleges enough street cred that they should have in our, in our student affairs and our higher ed world, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe after this conversation, <laughs> you know, the right people here, they'll oh, be like, maybe we can pivot. <laughs> yeah, we, I'm telling you, shout out to the community about something they're they're over there. Maybe we need to consider that model. Right. They're doing yeah. good work. Good work. They are. I couldn't agree more. And then, um, so so here's the question I have for you, like personally, right. just what keeps you coming back every day? Because I, don't I, know. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love your candor. Oh, no. I don't know. No, but it's, you know, when, I'm, I'm, we're having this conversation today because of what higher ed did for me. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I really connect my work, you know, it's ministry work. And I connect that to, you know, giving back in my own way. You know, I, I can't dance. I don't play sports well. Um, I'm not an artist, but my craft is, I see something special in students and I think I can connect people to that. And I can use that as a way to give back. So I would not be in this conversation if it were not for people in student affairs. You know, so I, I would not have the family that I have. I would not have the connections that I have. Um, so I see that as, you know, if I, I can be, you know, spiritual for a minute, that's my divine calling is to give back into this. And I see all the time, you know, folks say, you know, education's not right. I'm leaving the industry and you know, we shouldn't put our work before our families and work like balance and student affairs, all this stuff. I see that all the time. And I, I don't I don't hold that against anybody. But for me, you know, this is my why. You know, I, I see the faces. I hear the stories of students, not just at this institution, but at previous institutions, who all they need is a person. All they need is a person at that institution who sees what they don't see to help to cultivate and plant those seeds in them so they can reap those harvests and they can be better citizens for their communities and their families. That's the importance of this work. And it's not for everybody. It's not glory. It's not, it's not high paid. It's, it's, it's about, you know, what did I do today to get a student closer to graduation? So when you ask, you know, why, why do I do this as a first gen student who, you know, the only one of my siblings to go to college, the only one of my siblings to realize that this is the ticket, you know, to give back and to do more and to be better for myself and my community and for my family, um, then this is more than work. And I know a lot of people say that, a lot of people frown on that, but I'm gonna claim mine because I know why I'm here and how I got here. And that's because of the power of education and giving that back. Um, that's how I can do a good work, a great work you know, is to, to continue to pour back into students. So I love it. It's tiring. 
and stressful. You take home the, the ills and the woes of your students every single day, but you also get up the next day and say, how can I be better for them? Um, and it's, it's, it's a powerful thing when we have people who are willing to sacrifice so much to do that for others. Um, and I think it's a very noble calling. So for those colleagues who have stuck with education, whether it be the classroom or the counselors or the bus drivers or the cafeteria workers at the K-12 level, um, or our faculty members at the, the collegiate higher ed level, you know, keep going because these students need us. Um, and the ones who are sticking to it and who are going through the fires are the ones who are getting students across the stage. And those are the students who are coming back to campuses later and years later and saying, you know what, you know, because of you, I, I made it. So that's the reward for me. Um, and I, I know there are a lot of other folks who are in that same boat. And, you know, I, I applaud them for sticking to the work. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. It's more than just, it, it's a calling for you. It, it's like, it, it is. And on the journey with your students, you're invested. Yeah, it's, it seems kind of, you know, I, I said, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter, she asked me a couple of months ago, she's like, why do you even, how do you do this? And I said, you know, so she's like, that's lame, you know, but I was like, but it's real, you know, and I think you have a lot of people that have that same philosophy that nowadays is almost like it's, it's, it's not a thing that you say openly because there's so many thoughts about the profession and, you know, how people are mistreated. And, and I get that. I do. Um, but again, we talked earlier about leadership. So I think leadership plays a lot of part in this about, you know, who wants to work for who and where. That's important too. Um, so when you talk about doing this work, it's really about who's leading your teams also. Because you know, some people are like, I'm not gonna work at that campus because so-and-so is there. That's a thing. So I, I don't ever wanna be that person. I, I wanna cultivate leaders in my space. Um, and when they're ready to go, I'm gonna be okay with that. I'm not gonna talk bad about people and say, no, nah, you ain't going. No, I want you to go out and be great because you came from my shop. Uh, but I think if we have philosophies like that in good leadership roles, then I think the industry would be a lot better than it is right now. Yeah, agreed. And leadership is is essential. Um, and so just for our like final question, for people who are considering working in the student affairs space, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for them in terms of how to prepare? Are there certain, because I know you had both formal education and then you worked in the field for a long time and then that's yeah. how you kind of worked your way up. Um, so what advice would you have for them on how they can, you know, can prepare for a role in, in this sector? I, I would tell them, as I do often, um, that this is a greater good and that we need people to do this work who want to do it and that they're doing it for reasons that are genuine and that are good and that are kind and that they see that students that we serve, you know, we, we have a philosophy that I use here that's called keeping students safe. Um, that's supported, appreciated, focused, and employable. That if we go into our work with that foundation, whether it be you are a hall director in a residence hall, or if you are a career counselor trying to help a student determine where they want to go professionally, if we focus on keeping students safe, that this is the calling for you, that it's not, you're not going to get rich in higher ed unless you are like the chancellor of the largest system in the nation and you make a half a million dollars maybe. But, you know, this is not work where you would go home and, and be like Thanos and sitting on the porch and looking at the fruits of your labor. That's not what this is. This is hard work. And it requires people who really see that for what it is, number one, and who genuinely know that they can do some good. So I, I say to young colleagues and young professionals who are trying to identify if they really are about this life, that you can be, um, but that it will require you to put in a lot, but you would get so much more from it. Um, that the doors will open um, and that you will be rewarded for pouring into people. And it may not look like, you know, some people think, but I get satisfaction seeing students graduate. You know, and I think other people do that do this work. So if you are wanting those type of rewards and compensation is important, don't want to take away from that. But if you are willing to, to, to pour into others, um, I think that this is the calling for you because you can really do some good work and work with students. 
Absolutely. Well, th- and thank you for that. And I know, and, and for people who don't know Dr. Wade, follow him on Twitter or LinkedIn, because he he uh, is always, <laughs> always posting some like really some good nuggets and gems where I'm like, I you know, what? it makes me <laughs> kind of look at other, like I'm looking at like some VP student affair positions, like oh, maybe I need to get back in student because I do Come miss on. the work. Come on, what's it called? What's it called? Come on. Uh, <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, just the way you you shed light on like some of the issues that students may experience and even staff, but then talk, you're very solutions driven too. You talk about like how we can fix some of these things in yeah. higher ed. I appreciate that approach too. And I think well, thank you. I, I appreciate the kind words. And you know, I think we, we gotta have conversations about that stuff. And you know, sometimes it can be controversial, sometimes it can be like, oh talking about that but if we don't talk about it you know how are we ever supposed to know how we can fix things and you know we these students their parents their communities I think our country depends on us to do a good work um, and to be able to to have hard conversations but try to find some really good results so uh, I appreciate that yeah well yeah we appreciate you and the work you do for students and thank you so much and thank you for being a guest on our show today absolutely i'm, I'm trying to represent for the student affairs folks so yes you know, I, I we appreciate need to get that for the <laughs> invite and, and keep having this forum you know keep engaging in this space and keep doing the work that you're doing because you know you may not know it but these conversations lead to more conversations and you're really impacting change um and students lives by just having this space in this forum so i, I appreciate you for doing it Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. There's some days I'm like, well, I don't know if anybody's listening, but hopefully. Oh, no. it's okay. it, it, all, all it takes is one. All it yes. takes is one. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you again for your time today and Absolutely. we appreciate you.